All right, Gunnar, we're all set. All right, Matt, thank you very much. Good morning and welcome, everybody, to the Mozilla Webmaker Weekly Community Call. It is great to see so many names in the Etherpad. Hopefully you are, in fact, looking at the Etherpad, etherpad.mozilla.org slash OCT23, capital O-C-T-2-3. And I draw everyone's attention to line 74, where weekly updates and other asynchronous information sources have been posted. Please, if you are aware of blog and press coverage, blog posts, or anything else you want everyone aware of, add it in that range. Without further ado, the topic I know is on the tip of everyone's brain, what is going on with MozFest, Michelle Thorne? And I realize everyone is muted, but in your muted state, let's give a big round of applause for the amazing heavy lifting Michelle is doing to make this festival epic, wonderful, legendary, and talked about until the end of time. Over to you, Michelle. Yay! It's like, what's the sound of one gunner hand clapping? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so um, all of our efforts are not for naught. <laughs> With um, 827 people signed up to be coming to MozFest and 85 volunteers and reps supporting the way, we are wow. nearly at 100, or what's the word, 1K or 1,000 people. Um, which is kind of insanity. So what we're going to do actually to an an answer to the question on line 109 is we're keeping um, paid registration open until the end of the week because we're doing a bit more um, outreach efforts and we still want to make sure we get a few more tickets in. But we are closing the sign-up forms that many of you have seen in various shapes and sizes um, and creating an – and so if you are – Using that for anything, um, and it doesn't work starting tomorrow, um, you can email me with your story of why you still need that form. Um, and in other news, we have, thanks to Rebecca, about 85% of our schedule um, is up on Lanyard. All the times and all the dates are not final. Don't even look at the times and dates because you'll go mad. But it's really nice to see all these different cool topics coming together, and it even has the people who are running them, so you can even see all the lovely faces who are facilitating interesting sessions. And we're migrating that over to the website um, this week and next. I've been chatting a lot with uh, kind of our track theme curators um, on some meta outcomes for, for different themes, which is quite exciting, and hopefully you can share some more polished stuff on that front soon. And um, yeah, just trying to map all this wonderful activity to the nine stories of digital making paradise that is Ravensbourne. So that's kind of the latest. Um, I guess I, I also just wanted to add a minute or two if anyone has any questions that you need to know and don't know yet and you want to ask them now for the benefit of all, I'm happy to help answer or other people can help answer. And well, gee, Michelle, this is, this is Gunner. If I were somebody that was coming to the festival and felt conceptually like I had a little bandwidth or wanted to help out, what would you tell me is something I should anticipate throwing down on, or how could I find out when I get there what to throw down on? What an excellent idea. Um, I would ask you then so I can uh, better orient your interest. Would you be interested in helping pull off kind of the logistics and operation of the festival, or are you interested in contributing in kind of a content level to particular efforts? I'm a sensitive content artist, and so I think I'd be more interested in agenda level contributions. And so I'm wondering how I would find out what those look like. Excellent. Well, they are a bit dependent on the different sessions, but you can kind of peruse at the moment Lanyard and soon on the site by uh, various themes and interests to find things that catch your eye. And we will also have volunteers on the spot who can help talk you through ways to get involved and help align your interests with opportunities to plug in. Um, other, you know, other than keep, keep taking a look and keep an open eye, and uh, when you get there on site, we'll help you in real time find the right things to plug into. Um, hey Michelle, there's a couple questions on like line 111 and 120. Yeah. So why close registration? Yes, at some point 
it's hard to feed people and have enough space for people to hack productively. So we are no at this year at least we're not in the O2, which is next door, which has like several thousand people. Um, we can only really handle like maximum a thousand people in the building. So this is why we're closing registration. Um, yes. Um, if you want to volunteer, um, if you want to help out, let's say with logistics and operations, I'm going to drop a link in to our volunteer coordinator, who is definitely help, happy to help plug people in. And if you're interested in storytelling, Matt and Rebecca might add the details of how you can um, help with that. Um, can people see the space? Yes. Thanks for somebody posting the link to the location. You can see the building and their website. The Ravensbourne website has even more inside shots. Cool. Well, I'm happy to keep answering stuff um, asynchronously. I'll still be in this section writing things. But thanks to all for, for the good questions and for all the help for putting this together so far. Thank you, Michelle. And again, my hat is off to your ability to say zen and stang sanguine through total chaos. So I am I'm encouraging everyone here to anticipate buying Michelle inordinate amounts of adult beverage at the point that she can consume them without compromising her festival role. So thank you very, very much. Let us move on down. I'm just seeing if there's any other questions popping up there. Um, Matt, do you want to say anything more about storytelling at the festival and sort of where people could plug in or help out with that? Uh, you know, mundane things like the role of hashtags, but also more operational stuff, like if people want to blog, how they can support the larger storytelling? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Rebecca and I will have some, we're working on some documentation for that this week. So I think we will do like a whole kind of five minute item on that in next week's call, including covering all the various um, hashtags that we're working with for the different streams. So maybe we'll just like uh, punt that to next week if that's okay. We should have more then. That is awesome. Love it. Okay. And I am not seeing anything else in that section that looks like it needs addressing right this minute. So thanks everybody for putting in those great questions. All right, so I am going to turn everybody's attention to line 137 in the Etherpad, the Hacktivate Learning Building a Web Maker Educator Community. Matt, do you happen to know who's got that item? I think this is Chris Lawrence. Uh, Chris yeah, Lawrence, um, come on me? down. Yes, you're the next contestant on the Agenda Topic is Right. Awesome, and I, I will note that I did the unmuting in a very seamless fashion. Mm -hmm. um, well, everybody, um, just want to kind of update everybody on some of the new things. Chris, can you increase your volume? Uh, oh, you need my volume increased? All right, hold on. How about now? Is that there? Not really. Um, all right, how about that? Have you been shrunk down to subatomic size? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what's the problem. I'm on my phone. Um, how about this? Is that better? A little bit. <laughs> um, I am rarely accused of being too quiet, so this is new for me. Well, I think this is definitely workable, so let's go and see if anyone ends up suffering. Gotcha. Okay, I will uh, talk loud. Um, so just want to talk a little bit about some of our starts, um, thinking about how we better activate or hacktivate, as we've been calling it, um, an educator community. And um, as everyone knows, uh, Mozilla has definitely been invested and in learning for about the last two to three years um, and really drilling down on that over the course of the last 18 months. And so not only are we invested in what we can do with, within learning, but also I'm very proud uh, as a Mozillian to be also willing to be our own learning community and to, to to react quickly to what we learn um, in real time with our activities. So, hey, Chris. Yes. I'm I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm just lots of people are reporting in Ether chat that they they can't hear you and desperately want to. Is All there right, any sure. way that you might be able to call back in on a different device and we can Let come me back try to you? My landline. So give me a couple minutes and you can go to Hackable Games and loop me back. Sounds good. Excellent. All right. Well, Pomax, we're sorry 
to throw you into the fray without any warm-up or, or national anthem type behaviors, but if you don't mind stepping up on line 160 and talking to us about hackable games, we would appreciate you taking one for the team. I can certainly do that. Let me just share my screen so that everyone can see what I'm going to be talking about. So if people want to follow along, there's a link on line 163. Just click there, enter any name, and you can see Pomax's demo. All right, so in the meantime, while everyone's loading that up, um, Chloe and Alan Kligman and I have been working on some hackable game templates and hackable games basically using Thimble uh, with the JavaScript enabled so that you can actually do funky library things. So we hooked up a box to DGS physics engine to the standard Thimble setup. And for everyone who's following along, um, hopefully this is legible. It's a normal Thimble view, and it has a little page on the left that has some HTML on game. It has some CSS styling. And then all the way at the bottom, it has two links that loads up uh, a physics engine and some custom handling. And without anything that users have to do, you can already start playing this game. It's a very simple Pong game. It's WS for the left player. It's up and down for the right player. Um, so that's, that's a start. Um, and what we wanted to do was make it something that people can turn into their own thing. I know I'm losing. It's terrible. Hang on, hang on. There. Um, so. In order to make this your own game, we wanted to let people be able to change the styling without the game constantly resetting, as well as changing um, what the game actually does. So we're still in the process of making the game uh, customizable in terms of parameters, but we'll show you some of the things that we can do with it. Um, and it's a bit of a shame that Mark Thurman isn't here. He likes to use the metaphor of a, uh, an Angry Birds game where you substitute the bird with your teacher or your classmates. So I'm going to make a Pong game um, using Mark Sermon, which is probably the best thing I could do. <laughs> Mark Sermon. This sounds utterly terrifying. No, no, it's <laughs> going to be fantastic. Let's find a good picture of him. Um, that's not him on the end there. This? No, that's, <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's not going to work. <laughs> a dystopian future. What's a, what's a happy one? This looks like a happy Mark. There's one that's round. Well, you know what? I'm just, I'm just going to use his face as paddles. That's a good one. So this should do. Um, so well, oh, paddle. Background image. Background size. I think I like where this is going. Excellent. And let's make that a little wider. Nice. And background position. Oh, cool. Minus 10px, zero. There we go. That's Mark. Um, and then instead of a ball, let's use the Firefox logo because that's always a good idea. That's a bit too big. That'll do. Copy and paste. Sweet. And I start playing that. Yeah. Hey, Jay Vikti la call ke la hai. Jay Vikti na, tum sa call hold var the la hai. Tum hi baat pahu shakta ki wo nantar kya call karu shakta. Jis vikti ko aapne call kiya hai. The conference has been muted. I'm not sure what just happened. Nice. But, uh, that, was, that was the spirit of Mark Sermon protesting his head being beat upon by a logo. <laughs> well, too bad for him. You know what? Let's make it, let's make it one step cooler. Because um, I saw... <laughs> Back on URL. There. Wow, very cool. And then while this is playing, I also don't like the screen color anymore, so let's make that orange. Um, so that's, that's some of the things we can change. And just because I want to make Mark's life a little harder, I'm just going to make sure that he has... Let's try this. Oop. 
there. You should now have quite a number of Firefox logos to have to contend with. Wow. Uh, so this, this all works pretty much out of the box, and it's, it's terrible, terrible physics, uh, but it's fun enough to play with them. There's a few things that are left in this game that, um, that needs addressing, and one of them is what would you guys think are good hacks? Simple hacks, so something that kids can do, or people who just want to spend a few minutes on this, uh, they don't want to sit down the entire day and come up with a completely new game. What would be a cool thing to do with this in addition to making something like Firefox Mark? Hmm. Can you be more specific about the kinds of ideas you're looking for? What we were thinking, um, and we want to try and get in over the next few days, is things like additional key controls. Right now you can only move the paddles up and down, which is fun, but we can probably also make them all cardinal directions, so you can just move the paddle freely, um, see if that makes the game more interesting. Maybe add some kind of custom behavior on when the ball hits something, like the wall, maybe it should speed up, maybe it should speed down, maybe it should make the paddle smaller or maybe bigger. Um, just small things that, that you would think are not a lot of work, um, but might be fun for someone to see happening if they didn't expect it. Um, we had an etherpad up for it. Excellent. Let me just scroll back down to that and unshare my screen. Um. Yeah, so you're getting suggestions, Pomax, like uh, shoot. Shoot. Oh my god. Uh, color change on impact. Mm -hmm. um, being able to put English, like spin on the, on the ball. The shape of the box. Electroshock. Music. Music. Is a, Laura, we need a definition of electroshock. Yes, we do. Uh, music is um, a good idea, although do you mean like background music or do you mean like sound effects when the ball hits a paddle or a wall and goes the burp? Sound effects are always a good idea. Music may be extremely annoying if someone decides to play the burp song as a background music. Hmm. <laughs> well, should we open it up uh, to questions and suggestions? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. See, is this shareable? This is definitely shareable. You can tweet as much as you like. Um, the main page doesn't actually say very much other than there's not much here, but here's the Pong link. So if you want to share, you probably want to share uh, specifically the Pong page. If you want to entice people to hack on it with us, then I would recommend tweeting about the GitHub link, and then people can check that out and play with it and do pull requests and help out in that respect. Very cool. I don't know what hashtag this should be using, um, so let's just make one up. Let's, let's use Moz Games, because uh, yeah. I think that's what we're going to propose for the MozFest hackable game stuff. Does that work for you? That works fine. Cool. Moz Games. Making makey type things where keys can be changed. Yeah, actually, you know what? I think that Alan's already working on that. So what's a what's a makey makey type thing? Um, what I would imagine a makey makey type thing to be is something where you can dive a little deeper. So you you don't just change the parameters, but you can also add a little script handling or something that that does it for you. Makey makey is a thing. Yes, it is. <laughs> ah, makey makey is a thing. Oh, okay. I get it. Sort of arrows to find cause effect. Oh, cool. Some of these are probably going to be post most test ideas that we want to keep working on. Um, other things are probably if it's if it's easy to do with the physics engine, then we'll just add it in and let it happen. So something like. Uh, gravity and a spinning ball, that should all be relatively easy to add in. Nice. Well, if we have Mickey Mickey at MOSFET, then we're definitely going to drop by or make them drop by on our session. Right on. This is fantastic. Thank you so much. Hey, process point, are you POMAX or POMAX? POMAX. Comax, just double checking for the community at large. Excellent. Well, dude, I think you've lit everyone's metabolic engines in the respectively early parts of our days. So thank you. This is super, super cool stuff. Uh, I'm not seeing any other questions that seem burning. Uh, you're just getting a lot of love in the chat. I would encourage you to screenshot that and save it for a rainy day. But uh, this is 
fantastic. You know what I'm going to do because it's already a live thing? I'm just going to take this link from Mark's Happy Fun Time game and put it in the Etherpad. And people Love it. Very cool. Excellent. Thank you, thank you. This is very cool. So and we'll look forward to seeing the, the lit up faces at the festival as they get to pick their head of choice and their projectile of choice and figure out what collision looks like in their metaphor. So very, very exciting. Okay. The call is out. Has Chris Lawrence reconnected on a more robust audio channel? Dot, uh, dot, dot. I have. Can you hear me? And is it better? Chris, it feels like you're sitting next to me. I can smell your coffee, dude. This is great to have you back. Well, at least the coffee is masking my other smells. Um, Excellent. <laughs> all right. So I'm back um, and louder. So as I was saying, and probably most people missed it, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the beginnings of what we're calling the sort of Hacktivate Learning, and so how do we build a webmaker educator community. Um, and I think what I wanted to start off with was not only is Mozilla about learning externally, I really am excited that Mozilla is very internal about its learning too. And so there's really been over the eight, last 18 months three projects that I think we've deeply learned from that are really starting to build um, steps forward on a lot of different ways, and this represents one of those steps. And so that really has been um, obviously the development of the Webmaker tools, everything from X-ray goggles and popcorn and thimble and what's soon, soon to come next. Um, and then secondly, uh, the Summer Code Party I think was super informative when we learned a ton about outreach, about engagement, about the interest, about what people are thirsty for and hungry for from Mozilla and hungry and thirsty to give back to Mozilla. And then thirdly, um, the project that I run here in New York City, the Hive Learning Network, we've learned sort of very explicitly how you actually do link together maybe on the surface disparate uh, education professionals, how, what kind of systems and infrastructure you do to, to build a laboratory for innovation, um, and then how to actually spin that off into new locales, whether they be explicitly in new hive locations, which I can talk about in a second, or about just how you have to map some of that process um, into other locations and activate that same energy. So those three, building off that, those three things are really what's informed us in this expanded thinking about what we mean when we say, you know, what is a sort of global community of webmaker educators. Um, and then Hacktivate Learning um, is the way in which we'd like to take educators, who, and I'll talk about that definition in just a second, and turn them on to the kind of things that we're thinking about that isn't just tools, but it's about um, a uh, from consumption to production model, um, about web literacies, um, and about deeper engagement with, with sort of networked culture and con contributor-driven culture that obviously is, is the, the lifeblood of Mozilla. Um, so quickly, when, I, when we talk about educators, there's been a lot of conversations over the last year about how we actually talk about um, who, who we mean when we say educators, or we've called them instructors. You know, teachers obviously is a very comfortable one that we're all familiar with. And one of the reasons that we landed on educator um, really is because a, when we actually talk to people that are in, engaged in teaching and learning, that's the word that most people find some kind of self-identification as or with, especially sort of when given a, a, a menu of, of choices. And two, we think it does actually speak to the largest uh, tent approach um, that most people can find some kind of comfort level within that. And so when we talk about educators, we really – it is a big boat. It's everything from the mentor or the scout leader um, all the way up. I like to say it's everything from the Girl Scout leader to the tenured professor and all of the different strands in between. So that, of course, means teachers in a variety of content areas that are in schools and colleges and K-12, that is informal educators who work in libraries and museums and parks and rec centers, um, and that's peer-to-peer -peer mentors, people that are just interested and sort of involved in helping their peers um, or mentees learn something in some capacity. So in some way that you identify yourself as interacting with the process of helping and teaching other people, you fit into our, education, our definition of an educator. So I think that's an important point. And so we really began about a month ago – actually, we've been thinking about this 
the entire time we've been working on these other projects like Hive, like the WebMaker tools, like the Summer Code Party, but have really started to coalesce that thinking into really a, a, a movement and a agenda for the coming year at the very least. And so I wanted to share here and get some deep feedback um, on some of our first efforts. Um, and so that is really represented on line 144 by uh, building out the WebMaker Teach page of the Mozilla Wiki. Um, so you can sort of get some of our thinking there. And I'd really like to focus on what is our first attempt to kind of activate contributors as well as provide a resource for educators who are looking to find things to do with their, their learning audience. And so that's – so it does sort of frame some of our thinking there and sort of our first attempt at that. But also I might put your attention to the resources area of the page. I'm going to open it myself as well so I can look at it. Um, which does start to spell out how we're thinking about how people might contribute and use this growing resource pool of the – of educators who we've sort of activated or we've actually produced and things that they're thinking about um, contributing to. And so I just want to quickly sort of how we've categorized those. Um, so web making resources, that is sort of a very explicit, these are web making learning and teaching tools. Um, so that is where some of our stuff lives, obviously Thimble and some of the activity kits along the lines of using uh, those kind of tools or processes to learn HTML or CSS or JavaScript and beyond. But then we've also thought about what, especially if we're taking a big boat approach and really making this a welcoming environment for educators to think about this world of, of web making and sort of digital literacy even broader, is that we have to have different landing spaces of comfortability, as well as understanding that in a learning trajectory there's many places where people might want to tease this out. And this is very much built off Michelle Levesque and, and Doug Belshaw's work, um, sort of examining this world of what educators and instructors think and need. And so web literacy, so that is so a literacy piece. What do we mean by that? What are some resources for that? What, how is that sort of in a societal context? Um, also, youth and participant development. So sort of regardless of what it is content-wise you're teaching, what are the tips, the strategies, the pedagogies and theories about actually teaching and learning with people. So that might even be everything, what's a great starter activity when you've got 40 strangers looking at you looking to learn, um, to some things to – those kind of things that help you actually think about learning and how people learn. So we're very we're, – we're hungry for people's examples of those, things that people can, can sort of rip and read and push-pull into their activities that sort of help get people in the right frame of mind. And fourth, it's very difficult to talk about moving people from a consumption to production, production teaching model without actually curriculum, lessons, examples of how we actually get people to be creative, to produce things. And so this really is a spot for my way I like to talk about it is you can't really make a kick-ass popcorn video if you don't have some understanding of how to use audio and video to tell a story. So this is where great lessons and curriculum and, and activities that might help people actually think about the creative process and how you might produce a video and you know, everything from the, the technical part to, 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 to aesthetics, to those kind of things that actually help people um, think about production as uh, you know, a creative endeavor and then how the web and our tools might enhance that um, and sort of connect to our thinking. Um, so I'd love to pause there if there's any questions or if someone wants to shout out to me a question that pops up. I don't want to just be talking, so if someone wants to interject, please do. But then I will also move on. So please feel free to interrupt me um, or Matt call out a question. Um, the, uh, so the, as we move on into the next phase of this, and really this is all real-time thinking, so I'm sharing this at a very basic level, which is why I'm very excited to, to get people's feedback. The next stage really is how do we leverage the work of Hive and building sort of explicit learning networks with uh, multinodal connections and partnerships and collaborations with the kind of outreach and global movement of the Summer Code Party. So why can't we have Summer Code Parties sort of every day in all kinds of places where we're helping to frame, scaffold, and learn from the community? So that is the bigger goal. And so within that goal is how do we actually carve out places on the web and in coffee houses and in classrooms that these things, these kinds of issues, um, things can be built, 
um, this agenda can be pushed forward. And so we're starting to look at places like peer-to-peer -peer university, possibly building out, um, you know, multi, I can never say it right, but MOOC, multi, open online courses where the, these kind of conversations where build it, talk about it, reflect, rebuild it can actually happen on a, on a, on a global scale and how Mozilla can be seen as a convener um, and as a, an assistant and as a learner within that space and, and carve out places for that to happen. So those are some of the initial thinking. If you kind of see within the wiki, you can kind of see how we're beginning to think about what we'd like to build, what we'd like to work on, and some of which that I've already mentioned here um, quickly. Um, but these four bullet points, I think, really start to articulate that. And I want to really stress that via the Hacktivate Learning theme within Mozilla Festival is really the, the first real landing space for this. And we've, uh, Laura Hilliger and I and many others have really worked hard to, to figure out what that looks like and how it connects to the broader festival and really start to tap that same kind of desire to come to Mozilla Festival and announce your project, hack on your project, collaborate on your project, and bring your project to some kind of next stage by Sunday evening, the kind of Friday night to Sunday night trajectory of the festival to educators and have them also be welcomed in that process, not only just advising the tool building, but how do you actually take that certain sort of builded approach to lessons, to curriculum, to activities, to learning artifacts that can then feed into this resource and become a robust uh, repository and conversation about what actually happens when you put these tools, these thinking, these pedagogies out into the world and people, real people, students, teachers, adults are interacting with it, learning from it, and, and driving it forward. So that's my quick pitch, and uh, I'd love to hear feedback, answer questions, and have a little bit of discussion with the remaining time. Thank you so much, Chris. And Matt, might I invite you to be the question valet and sort of cherry pick from 169 through 179? And Chris, you can be looking there as well as we go. But uh, Matt, what there looks like stuff we might want to unpack in real time. There's one question on line 170 I, I, that I guess is broadly about um, you know, questions that some educators might have, particularly those that are new to this space, around like safety, like making sure that the kind of online safety of their, their learners is, is protected. Um, and so Chris, I wonder if, if you know, do you get that question from, from teachers sometimes, and, and how, do you, how do you answer it? Well, we get that all the time, honestly, whether it's web making or other sorts of um, learning innovations that sort of cross over into digital tools or even into to physical making as well, whether it's safety or whether it's appropriateness to larger curriculum goals. So I have a, one, I have a couple, couple ideas about that. One is that whether it's building spaces like a PTPU or MOOCs or just larger conversations, We'd like to also convene, we, don't, we aren't necessarily the experts on that. We have expertise on aspects of that within the, the, the people working on this, but really is as much convening what it is from educators that will help us understand how to do that better, what, what the concerns are, and what the parameters of engagement are on all these different kinds of spaces. So part of it, I don't want to sound like I'm punting, but part of it is that we really want you to help us think about that. How do you integrate that? What is the narrative that works best? How do we need to know what's going to work and not work in your context? Context. I think about I worked using x-ray goggles last spring with a large after-school network in New York City, and we're working on a curriculum for that that took x-ray goggles and basically the activity kit and very much mapped it to the real-life concerns, issues, fears, and excitements of the after-school educator in that context. And so that's everything from there's homework help, there's bathroom breaks, there's snacks, there is security issues, you don't know what kind of equipment you're going to get in every space. So we'd love to engage in conversations. And then I think that what you can do, the contribute piece, is that start building answers to those questions in your own context and sharing them back. There's only so much we can do on a small scale in terms of how that interacts with big systems that you know, here in the United States are you know, legislated through Congress in terms of things like DOMA and other kinds of child safety acts, but I think how we co-create the narratives and lessons that actually work from your concerns to the webmaker agenda is a, is a pathway that I think we're hoping to engage in by broadening the conversation. 
I hope that, that – does that sort of help? I don't want to sound like that we're sort of, you know, punting on that, but I think that's why we want to start these conversations so that we can have a multitude of examples about how to do that from the practitioner perspective. Cool. And there's some more um, detail and conversation on that thread under line 172, Chris, if you want to sort of chime in there. Um, I guess the other question in line 180, will this move to a page on webmaker.org or what's the plan for how we're going to make this page um, discoverable for, for teachers and educators and instructors? Sure. Um, I think the, the short answer is yes. Um, you know, the timeline we don't know necessarily. And, but I, I do want to stress that of course we will have a, a space within webmaker.org. But part of this also, which I think we deeply learned from the Summer Code Party, is that it's not all about pulling people into, into our you know, URLs. And that what the Summer Code Party did, in my mind, at least you know, so amazingly, is that it took a colonizing approach to the kind of spaces that people are, people are in. So of course, we're signposting people back to webmaker.org and that that really is the central hub, but we were on Tumblr, we were on Facebook, we were in Google+, we were on Twitter, we were, we were interacting on, on local websites and spaces that, that networks and communities were using to, to dissect and engage in this stuff. And so I think that kind of approach is one that we're definitely going to think to, to leverage and utilize um, this sort of colonization approach to sort of being at first comfortable at being in other spaces and other sites where people are, and then obviously building robust landing places um, where people then can go to for more um, or to, to, to more deeply connect. And so the wiki really is kind of a beta test of what that site might be and look like and the kind of resources it might house. So I think in the short term, the more that we get um, that page sort of mapped out and our thinking on there and the resource pool being robust and used will really help to drive our thinking about what eventual pages on WebMaker might look like, do, act like. So that I think if you're really keen on diving into that piece first, that, that the, the wiki teach page is, is a great place to start prototyping. Cool. Maybe just one last uh, question, Chris, uh, on line 184. Um, how do we make these kinds of resources um, more accessible or friendlier for, say, instructors who are starting out and whose own level of, of web making literacy is fairly low? Like if those teachers are feeling a bit intimidated by the fact that maybe some of their students have you know, greater sort of technical skills than they do, is this still something that they can kind of grab onto and feel comfortable teaching in, in their classroom? Sure. So I think that's where sort of part of the Hive approach really comes in because that really is a blended hybrid approach to sort of from door to door plus web plus face to face engagement really happens. So within localities and Hive, you know, New York City is a locality, yes, but a quite a large one, um, that you have what Hive has done has to start to make multiple pathways for engagement. And so we're very concentrated on that you need to be face-to-face, -face, that you need to have a blend between online and, and physical, that sometimes um, going to where people are not only on the Internet but actually physically within classrooms, in informal learning spaces, um, is really a key to building this a little slower but that has real traction going forward. And so to that end, the Hive as a model, um, both sort of what I call capital H, which is actually putting hives in locations, and sort of lowercase h, which is mapping the philosophies, is happening at a pretty robust pace. So currently there's hives in Chicago and Pittsburgh, but Toronto, Athens, Greece, London, Berlin, Barcelona, LA, Bay Area are all places where this is starting to happen um, at various stages of development. And so you can imagine in this sort of networked global approach to our educator community that those kind of spaces become hubs within that as well as places that, that produce the kind of blended interaction that's really going to need so that it takes the door-to-door, person-to-person approach while thinking about global scale via uh, digital platforms. Very cool. Well, um, Thank you. I will attempt to go back and answer some of these, and um, I'll even maybe put my email in there or some way to contact me. 
And thanks for the time. This was great to, to talk about this. I know that we're all very excited on the Mozilla side, and I, you know, just a big shout out to all the people at Mozilla that have been helping about this. You know, whether that's Laura, Doug, um, Lainey, Michelle, all the Michelles. So anyone I forgot, this is really important to us, and there's a lot of people thinking about this, and we're really excited going into 2013. Right on. Chris, thank you so much. This is super exciting and definitely manifesting, I think, exactly what Webmaker wants to be and become. So thank you for all the great leadership. Speaking of great leadership, Brett Gaylor, you madman, it's incredible when the NBC Nightly News is talking about the upcoming Popcorn Beta release. I'm kidding just a little. Tell us about Popcorn Beta testers that you need to get this big, bad popcorn release out the door. Hi, Gunnar. Um, Hi, Brett. Just really <laughs> briefly, um, so as some of you probably know, we released our beta on Friday with Ryan's awesome TED Talk as well. Um, so this is the time when we really are looking for um, what we can honestly call beta testers now. So we, we have a beta, um, and it is at popcorn.webmaker.org. It is not at a weird uh, subdomain. Or, or anything else. And so we really are hoping that some of you on this call can help us to find those remaining bugs. Uh, it's always that last 10% that makes a big difference. Uh, so today we have uh, a push to our production server that uh, we're almost ready to, to make. We're just ironing out of some final bugs uh, that were identified by, um, by the last group of beta testers. And we're really excited about that, that group of people because we, we really see this as a, as a great way that those with, with some time that they want to contribute to WebMaker can pitch in. Uh, so the ask here is to look for an announcement on the WebMaker list, which we'll send out after we've made that push to production. Uh, and then you can use either the wiki page that we've identified on line 269, or some folks actually enjoy uh, creating an account on our issue tracker, and writing more detailed uh, feedback. So either or, the, if you create an account on our issue tracker, it's actually easier for us to, um, to get in contact with you again. So I, I would say that that's the preferred route if you, if you want to keep in touch. We've also filed a bug um, on, with Mozilla to make a, a WebMaker QA uh, list. So that will be upcoming as well. But for now, just look for that email and just want to underline again that this is a, it's a huge help uh, and it's, it's already made our project better. So yeah, that's, that's, that's it. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, I can look for them in line 275 or, or answer them now. Right on. Thank you, Brett. I just can't say emphatically enough that folks should go test the popcorn beta. There's a question on line 279 asking if people can share this. I presume the answer is yes, but Brett, could you confirm that? Yes. Yeah, so this meaning uh, the, beta, the QA wiki? Is that, I think that might be Doug. Or, what, Doug is or, Brown. Why don't you tell us everything we can share and anything we can't share? You can share it all. Um, but again, what we're asking is that uh, I think by the end of today, Eastern Standard Time is when we're going to make our push to production. So it would be the most useful if you could share that information uh, then. Just because w what we want to avoid is people reporting a whole bunch of bugs that we're actually, we've already fixed. So what we want to do is uh, push, make that push to production, which we're coordinating now, and then invite uh, a whole bunch of new folks in for QA. So should but, we hold yeah, off so till tomorrow, can... Brett? Should we hold off till tomorrow? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, if you want from official channels, it would be the most helpful tomorrow, Matt, for sure. Okay, cool. Love it. Any other questions or feedback from Brett before we move onward? Excellent. Well, Brett, thanks again, and we're super excited to see Popcorn 1.0, see the bright light of the full release day. Hey, turning everyone's Ooh. attention to line 283. Rebecca, you are the hardest working person in Lanyard land. Tell us what you've been doing vis-a-vis -vis migrating sessions into the Lanyard event schedule management platform. Hey, Rebecca, are you there? Are you there, sister? Uh, here I am. 
Gee, I was Excellent. just thinking about throwing off my cape and uh, starting to dance. Um, basically, all I would love for everybody to do is, if they have a chance this week, is to go on the lanyard and look for your listing. Um, the reason for this is, is that as we've been taking um, the information that you've put together on the wiki page and taking it to lanyard, we've been transforming them a little bit. Um, from stinky pieces with goals and outcomes and all sorts of awesomeness, and actually turning them into invitations um, because this is where uh, people who are attending the festival will be self-selecting where to invest their time while they're there. Um, so I would really like it if you could please take a look and make sure that um, some of the changes that have been made represent your vision for your session. And if not, please let me know. Um, everything is super fixable now, um, thanks to some really hard work by Andrew and Michelle and Matt. Um, and if you're not really sure how you want to um, present it to the outside world, if it's, some, if it's sort of like a different direction than you had considered when you uh, created your session, uh, there's on line 293, you can sort of see uh, the sections and the ideas, the title, descriptions, takeaways, who should come. Uh, those are some cues that we're using to help create your listings. Um, and uh, if you're not on there yet, you can send me an email to let me know. We do have a few that are not quite on um, on the lanyard listings just yet. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't love you and care. Um, so if you have any concerns, please let us know this week. That's all I have to say. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rebecca, and thanks for all the leadership on that front. Anybody have any questions about their lanyard sessions? And um, just so everybody is clear, uh, lanyard is the technology we're going to be using in real time at the event so people can see what's up at any given time. Uh, and we're going to welcome people's feedback on it because it, you know, it was a hard decision to decide to go with it, but it's the thing that we feel is the right platform for 2012. And we'll welcome people to both give us feedback and, and suggest ways we can make it a more effective part of the festival experience. Hey, so Gunnar, right. there, was a, there was a question earlier actually that I don't think we, uh, that we took out in the ModsFest section where people were just kind of asking about exactly that. Like, where does the schedule live? Does it live on the MozillaFestival.org schedule side in WordPress, or does it live on Lanyard or, or both? I am going to defer to the infinitely wiser and smarter Michelle Thorne to say what the talking points are on that excellent question. Michelle, could you unmute and join us in the audio channel? Hello. So we're going to – the data is all kept on Lanyard, and it's going to be pumped into the festival site. Um, so the festival site will have the most up-to-date stuff. They will put basically just be synced databases, and we're still figuring out what we will display in the building that will be most legible, but you will be able to use the site as well as Lanyard for the most up-to-date session info. Cool. So if folks make changes to uh, their session description on Lanyard, they can rest assured that those changes will then be imported by magic onto the WordPress site. <laughs> yes, auto-magically. Yeah, actually, Matt, it's cosmic magic, but yeah, same basic difference. <laughs> Cool. And Rebecca, so y you're going to get requests like the one on 306, like to that end, like, hey, I, ha I see something on Lanyard that I want to update or, or, or fix. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have a preference? I mean, self-service is good, right? I mean, I guess the, would you say um, that actually, it's better that people do it themselves, or would you prefer that they get in touch with you and have you do it? Um, I'm all for people self-starting. Um, it would be great if you've made a change um, and you let me know. Um, that will help me ensure that you're listing on Lanyard, which is where I'd like you to focus your efforts if you choose to do it yourself, um, gets imported to the festival side, uh, the festival site, uh, which is WordPress. Um, things um, in Lanyard work a little bit differently than they do on WordPress. Lanyard is a database of events that's open to the world. So we don't have as much control over um, things like uh, topics and descriptions um, because web native cinema would be lost in a global slurry of um, movie events and things like that, um, which is why it's uh, eventually going to be better. We can control how we present and what topics and themes, etc. 
uh, we present our sessions in um, on the festival website. However, Lanyard is the database where everything needs to go in um, for maximum exposure. So if you would like to do it yourself, please let me know. Um, that would be fantastic. Um, there is a little guide, like I said, at line 294 um, of useful information that I'm pretty sure that attendees would love to know. And please do consider it an invitation to people, um, to, the, to the exact people that you would like to attend your session while they're there. Cool. Thanks, Rebecca. Right on. Any other questions or clarifying comments before we move onward to the very exciting next agenda item? All right. So, Matt, tweet bank. Are you telling me we can get rich by tweeting? Tell us more. Well, you know, Gunnar, here in the WebMaker Communications Control Tower, we get a lot of requests to communicate stuff, to promote stuff that people on this call are doing. Um, and to get it into our various channels, like our at Mozilla Twitter account, Facebook account, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Rebecca and I have looked at a bunch of different ways to try and make that easier uh, for people uh, to kind of serve themselves. Um, and after looking at a bunch of tools, we've decided that the most elegant tool is the one in line 328. Um, we're calling it, for lack of a better word, an ether pad. Um, some of you may have used this technology already. And so if you want to get something into our channels, you can just click on that link. You can scroll down to the date that you're interested in. Maybe it's next week. Maybe it's today. And you can just go ahead and draft up a status update or a tweet. Um, now we're using what we're calling our Tweetomatic indicator, which is a little V. Um, that lets you know when you're getting close to 144 characters on the second line of your status update. So um, it's highly advanced experimental technology, but I would encourage everybody to use it. Um, there's some tips and tricks there on, on the pad. And as we get close to MozFest, the amount of communicating and promoting we're doing uh, grows to a huge rate. So we're really going to use this to kind of coordinate um, how we're sending status updates through our various channels in the run-up to the festival. So please go ahead and draft stuff, suggest stuff for us here, and we will use it. Thanks, Matt. And uh, anybody have any questions about that? It seems wonderfully self-explanatory. <laughs> yes, Laura, we're very proud of the V. We're web makers, you know. <laughs> right on. Was there, was there any, you know, talk about the cultural context of using a V versus a, a say, more international character, say like an in hmm. Yeah, we may, need, we may need some localization help at some point. Excellent. Well, it's good to know that's on your radar. Excellent. Well, beautiful people, as I scroll down in this technology known as Etherpad, I am seeing that we seem to have moved to the non-verbal updates phase of our day with four minutes remaining on the call. Are there any other orders of business before I adjourn us early and give people three minutes of their lives back? Excellent. Well, thank you all for joining us on another incredibly productive, exciting call. It is only the rumblings before the big festival extravaganza. Can't wait to talk to you next week, and we'll see so many of you in London in just a few weeks. Have a great Webmaker Week, and we'll see you back next time. Same place, same channel next week. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Please stand by.